My name is Robert Secord. Uh, if any of you were at the um, Oslo C++ user group yesterday, this is uh, a lot of overlap <laughs> with that talk. I'm just going to uh, focus on the, the, the second half of that talk, which was signed versus unsigned integers, and provide a little bit more detail. I don't have a ton of slides, which I usually do, which means the talk might fit, but also, you know, I could take questions while we're going. Um, I cut my travel very close, so there's a car waiting outside to rush me to the, the train station, and then I'm off to the airport and back to Portugal, finish my uh, three days left on my vacation once I'm done here. Um, and so uh, so after, after the talk, I've just got to run out. So, uh, you know, ask all the questions during the talk. If you, if you get between me and the door after the talk, uh, I'm nearly 300 pounds, and it's probably going to hurt. <laughs> um, so let me get started. <coughs> um, I did this poll question last night, but I'll, I'll do it again just uh, just in case this is a different audience. I've done this poll twice now, and it's I've gotten pretty much similar results each time. Uh, but um, you know, the questions around uh, when you know why do you choose to use an unsigned integer, right? And, and so the first reason is that uh, you use it if you want to have modulo behavior, and that's the only reason you, you choose an unsigned integer. The second answer is that you use unsigned integers because you, you want to represent a value that uh, can't become negative. It only is zero or, or positive value. Uh, and then finally is the, you know, I'm here for the snacks. They don't show me the results. They don't really have a, uh, you know, a, 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 a horse in this race. Is that, is that an idiom that translates horse in this race? It's a, yeah, I don't, I don't really care what the outcome is. I don't have an opinion on this kind of thing. Um, so how many, uh, number one, you only use unsigned integers for modular behavior? One, two, two. Okay. Uh, you only use unsigned integers to represent values that cannot be negative. Okay. And I'm only here for the snacks. Okay. So that's, that's a consistent result. Um, even the snack bit is about the same each time. Uh, I think uh, my problem is the use of only. I would say both of the two ways. Oh, maybe only is not a good word there. Uh, yeah, it's more about like when do you make this selection. I'll, I'll, I'll work on the wording, but, but, but I'm okay with the results. Uh, it's usually something like 20 or 30 to 1 um, in favor of the, the middle answer. Okay, so uh, last night I did the integers explained, but uh, here I'm cutting it out. So I'm, I'm basically omitting the intro material. Uh, it's kind of, it, it's, it's pretty obvious, you know, for those who were there last night, you know, it's probably nothing you don't know. It, it's kind of a good warm up to kind of get into the, the mindset for the rest of it. So, so if you have questions right off, that's fine. Um, so I'm gonna present um, the argument that's made for signed integers, and then I'll make the argument that's made for unsigned integers, and I'll try a, I'll try and, and fail to appear unbiased because I'm really biased and, and it's going to start to come out no matter what I do. Um, so when you're arguing for um, that first one, that you only use unsigned integers for, for modulo, I mean you're arguing that you use signed integers almost all of the time. And uh, the, the first uh, argument, or maybe the strongest argument is made is, uh, what about these loops that are limited by a lower bound? And so it's, it's very uh, easy to write tests that are, um, you know, always true or always false. Uh, so, you know, because uh, I, size t is an unsigned type, uh, it's used to, um, to, um, express the size of the largest object that can be allocated on a system. So on 32-bit architectures, it's usually a 32-bit unsigned type. And on 64-bit architectures, it's usually a 64-bit uh, unsigned type. So I is unsigned, meaning you know, it can never take on negative value. So we have this loop here um, that's going to loop uh, while I is greater than or equal to zero and decrement I each time. And so that's a rather obvious uh, infinite loop. If I get back there too far, it starts to feed back on me. Um, so 
So this is probably an, uh, an error, but there, there's no obvious uh, defect in the code. I mean, from a language perspective, uh, this code is fine. Uh, there's no UB or anything like that. So, so it's probably unlikely this would be uh, diagnosed. Uh, now, whether or not it's actually an error depends on you know the algorithm and what it's meant to do. Uh, but typically, when you're counting things, you know, wrap around is an error. Right? So, if you're Bezos and you have four billion dollars in your bank account, you put another dollar in your bank account, and you have zero dollars, uh, you would typically view that as as an error. Um, so the question is, you know, the, the, uh, you know, according to kind of the the the, the signed integer advocates, is is that this this loop could be improved by uh, using signed integers, right? So here uh, we're going to use a signed uh, size t type. Now, now this type is defined by POSIX. Uh, it's not in the C standard. Um, we had a TR at one point that had a, a signed size t on it, and if it come up for uh, vote to get into a standard, I would have done everything I could to, to, to block it <laughs> uh, unless this, this part was changed. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I've kind of commented here and there. See, my biases are really coming out already. But, uh, um, you know, this is, this is a hill I'm, I'm going to die on. <laughs> you know, I'm going to stand atop this hill and I'm going to keep signed size types out of the C standard for as long as I draw breath. Uh, so, um, and the other thing about C++ is I have a template class which takes any type of unsigned type and turns it into a signed type and takes any type of signed type and turns it into an unsigned type. So just the fact that you have a size T type means that you could, you know, create a signed <laughs> equivalent to that type. Uh, so, so the concept is clearly present in, in C++ and is also, you know, defined by POSIX. Uh, so, so now we have a loop that does terminate, right? And, and what this sign size t type does is, you know, POSIX defines it as having the range of minus one to size max. So, so they don't really care about the full range of negative values. They're just trying to uh, basically define a value which is not a valid count, right? So they can have something which indicates typically an error, right? So it's a way of doing inline errors which in itself is a flawed design, right? You should separate out your, your values from your, your errors. And, and C++ does that well, right? You have exception mechanism for reporting errors. You don't need to uh, wrap them into the value. Um, so, um, so this loop now terminates. And, and, and the reason, you know, again, the signed integer argument goes is uh, signed integers have this nice normal behavior around zero, which is a very common value, right? It's very common for uh, developers to to have values, integer values that are, you know, uh, some delta above and some delta below zero, right? So uh, signed integers are nice. Uh, you know, the math uh, around zero all works uh, very well. So this code does have a conversion from an unsigned type to a signed type. Uh, so obviously uh, not all the uh, values that can be represented in the size t type can be represented in the uh, the signed uh, size t type. So so that's an issue with this code. So you would probably have to add some sort of check to make sure that the value you know the value can be represented in the signed type. And then you know if it can't, then you have to treat that as some sort of error condition. So conversions to a signed type, as we see in this example, are also a bit problematic. Um, you know, when an arbitrary integer type is converted to a signed integer type, uh, if the value can be represented, it's going to be preserved. But if it can't be represented, there's either an implementation uh, defined result or an implementation defined signal is raised. So, so there's, there's some things that can go wrong with that conversion. So it's not, uh, it's, you know, it's not an unproblematic uh, uh, issue. Okay, so. Uh, a size value that can't be represented as a size t is frequently converted to a, a negative sign value, which for this particular loop would cause the immediate termination of the loop. So um, is that what's supposed to happen? I don't know. I don't know what the hell a negative signed, you know, a negative size is supposed to represent, right? Because it's, a, it's, not, a, it's not an actual concept, right? You have, 
uh, zero of something and then you have you get one and now you have one of something so you either have some positive number of things or you have zero of the things right and even this sign size type recognizes that they just allow for the negative one as a indication that there is no valid count um, so uh, yeah so that loop would would terminate uh, if the uh, size couldn't be represented, and then instead it gets turned into a negative value. So another solution is to initialize i to size minus one and decrement on uh, each iteration. Uh, so uh, here we have that. So now when the counter reaches zero, the decrement causes the counter to wrap around to the maximum possible value, which is size max. And that, of course, is well-defined behavior. That's how unsigned integers work, by, by wrapping around. So the value of i is uh, now larger than size, so um, the termination condition for the loop would uh, evaluate to false and the loop would terminate. So again, this is well defined in both C and C++ languages, uh, but um, unsigned integer wraparound is, is problematic and um, it's problematic in, in, in like at multiple levels of abstraction. <laughs> So, uh, so, so at the, the lowest level of abstraction, it's problematic because, um, you know, let's say you, you take the second argument here, which we all kind of raised our hands for, which is, you know, sizes should be represented by unsigned uh, types. Um, if you take that argument, then uh, all the, um, you know, all the arithmetic you're performing to calculate sizes and to calculate um, pointer locations is uh, unsigned arithmetic. And uh, that means that you're never going to have overflow, right? Uh, unsigned integers cannot overflow. They can only wrap around. So you're only dealing with wrap around. So, uh, you know, wrap around becomes an issue. And, and this, this type of problem is uh, really associated with vulnerabilities, right? So uh, if you, uh, memory safety issues, right? So if you miscalculate uh, the length of an object, if you allocate too little storage, uh, you know, if you have an upper bound incorrect, if you have pointer arithmetic that's incorrect, uh, you could easily wind up writing outside the bounds of an object because you've kind of lost track of, of where the bounds are. Um, so, so wraparound is really problematic for security. Now, as far as the C and C++ standard are concerned, it's, it's well-defined behavior. So, so you do get this sort of, well, you know, we can't trap on that, we can't say people can't do it because it's well defined. Uh, so in the CERT C secure coding standard, we definitely said no wraparound, <laughs> you know, and, and we allow we allow exceptions for it because there, there are algorithmic cases where you, where you need to use it. Uh, you know, one example is is modular arithmetic is used in uh, some um, some encryption algorithms. Uh, Daniela had another example last night about uh, uh, signal processing. processing. Yeah, so, so there are cases, they're pretty rare, right, but you have to allow for it, so there has to be an exception to this. But, but the, the, the larger cases, you know, again, if you're counting things and you have a wraparound, it's, it's, it's you know, typically an error. So, um, so you do want to, you know, look for this problem and diagnose it, right? And, and a real good way to do that is with uh, F sanitized unsigned integer overflow. Um, so uh, an, an issue here uh, is that, you know, if you're going to use that flag uh, and you, you design your loops like this, right, now these loops are going to get flagged. And so you've created uh, kind of a false, uh, false positive in your diagnostics, right? And so that's a, that's a, that's a PETA. You guys know what PETA is? It's pain in the ass. It's, it's kind of funny because you say PETA to not say, you know, ass on video. Uh, but then you find yourself explaining what PETA means and saying ass three or four times on video. <laughs> um, so, uh, so one solution, another solution is a do while loop. And, you know, C programmers and I guess C++ programmers are, are pretty enamored with that for loop. Uh, but, but the for loop is not fantastic. I'll go, um, let's see if I have a, I don't have a really good example of a for loop, but but the problem with the for loop is um, you have the body following the for loop. So this code is executed once before the loop. 
this is executed as part of the condition, and this is executed after the body of the loop, right? So, so the, the order in which this code is executed is different from the lexical order in which the code appears. And people complain about that in other constructs, but here they sort of ignore it or don't notice it for some reason. Um, but it does make reading the card, uh, the, the, the code a little bit harder, and people do wind up making mistakes as a result. So we can do a do while loop, and uh, I added that top line last night to uh, basically error out if, if the size request is zero. Um, so the remainder of this, um, you know, we just uh, have the do loop, we've got an unsigned type, and then we terminate um, you know, when we get to zero. And so, so this kind of solves all the problems, right? We're using the, the unsigned size type. Uh, we, we don't have any wraparound to be concerned about. And, um, you know, we don't have to do a conversion from a signed to an un, um, unsigned type with, you know, possible implementation to find behavior, possible out of range values and so forth. Okay. So, uh, kind of a related problem with unsigned integers, uh, you know, maybe a more general version is, uh, you know, you might uh, have, uh, uh, you know, end index into an array and a start index, and you're checking to see if, if the end is greater than the start as a, is greater than some safety margin, which is trying to, say, prevent writing beyond the bounds of this array. Uh, so the safety margin is typically some reasonably small integer. Uh, the problem here is that if the program fails to the programmer fails to guarantee uh, that that end in index is uh, uh, greater than start index, um, you um, you this 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 test could fail. So so there's a, a guarantee that has to uh, be provided, and you know it might be provided by the code, um, or uh, it might be something that you have to test for. Okay. So both unsigned and signed operations can wind up being erroneous. Um, the, um, the bigger problem with, with unsigned is that the problem area is, is you know, less than zero. And, and so, uh, so this area here is kind of a common area for people to perform operations. Again, this is the signed integer argument. I'm, I'm trying to make it clear that, that I, don't necessarily buy this, but, but you know, the common operations are here around zero, and so, um, you know, so people, programmers commonly encounter the problem area using unsigned. So that's the argument to use signed. So here around zero, uh, signed has, has, you know, perfectly fine behavior, and it's only out here on the fringes that um, signed integers become problematic, and you know, the theory is that uh, we're probably not dealing with, with these very large and very small values uh, uh, quite as often. So, uh, now, now, the problem with that theory is um, security, right? So, when you're dealing with safety, you can kind of look at probability of things. Like, what's the probability of, of having this extreme value uh, uh, occur? Uh, but when looking at security, you know, the probability of an edge case should be viewed as 100% because you're dealing with an intelligent adversary, like me, say I'm your adversary, right? So if I'm pen testing or, you know, attacking your system, which, you know, I, I, I wouldn't do because you're all very nice people, but, <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to look for the edge cases, right? I'm going to uh, input, you know, values at minimum, maximum ranges and see if I can, you know, trigger, uh, some edge case that your code failed to account for, and then uh, see what fun might ensue from there. Uh, so if you're programming with you know, safety and security in mind, uh, you can't ignore the problem areas for signed integers, right? But you're, you're kind of trying to simplify things so that you know, really inexperienced programmers can uh, you know, luck out and, and get lucky more often and have correct C++ code. So, uh, so I, I guess I don't really care. You know, it's, it's kind of weird because I, I've, I've been in the C committee for a long time and I've always noticed that they didn't care about, um, at all, about, um, 
about um, naive programmers, you know, beginning programmers. Uh, they really only cater to experienced programmers. But uh, I'm now sort of seeing where they're coming from in that uh, I, I, I think it's really important that you design the language in the libraries so that experienced programmers can write correct code. I think that's the most important thing. I don't think you want to, you know, make it hard uh, to write correct code so that beginners won't trip on type of errors. Like JavaScript, to me, does a really, really stupid thing, right? You can take five and add it to the string seven and get 57, right? And so that's nice from a user interface perspective, right? Where beginner programmers don't understand the difference between numbers and strings, right? They all kind of look the same to them. But that starts to create some really problematic behavior, some unexpected uh, things when uh, you know, you're assuming some, some level of type safety. So, okay. Um, so, observations so far. Um, if developers are using signed integers to avoid thinking of the behavior around zero, they are definitely not thinking about the overflow behavior at the edges. Um, you know, the type of problems we've seen so far that would result from using unsigned integers typically like an infinite loop on a counted down um, for loop, and those are really easily detected during testing, right? Uh, gee, my, my program stopped responding to me, right? There's, a, there's an infinite loop. Um, and, uh, and basically, you know, if you're doing security and safety, safety critical software, you, you really can't be, you can't tolerate sloppy programming of any kind, right? So kind of coming up with this approach and this design and, and sort of, you know, changing the, the libraries, the APIs of the library to accommodate, you know, the use of signed integers when really unsigned integers are appropriate is, is a, you know, a, is heading in the wrong direction for language like uh, C or C++. And so, uh, you know, so, so I, I never really thought I would give this talk. I mean, I've been talking about integers uh, since 2004, 2005. I start teaching them at CMU to CS undergraduates and to graduate students in the INI program. And then, you know, about a year ago, we were trying to adopt uh, some bit utility interfaces from C++ for the C language. And there was this extensive use of signed types in the interfaces. And so we were looking at this and thinking, you know, what the fuck is going on here? Why, why, you know, why are they using signed types to tell us which bit is being referenced, right? It, it's it's an unsigned value. It's between zero and 32 or some positive number. Um, and so, you know, as I sort of saw this insanity more and more, I developed a theory <laughs> as to why this was happening. And, and about a month ago, someone sent me the, a link to this talk. Uh, and, and, this, uh, and this was a panel uh, at uh, Going Need of 2013. And, and, and this was what I suspected was behind this, uh, which is, you know, Bjarna has come out on uh, a couple occasions, also in his book, and said, uh, you know, just use signed int. You know, just use it all over the place. Uh, and his, his argument is, uh, and, and you'll see this repeated in a second, you know, his argument is, um, you know, signed and unsigned being mixed in a single expression causes a lot of problems. So I agree with that. Uh, but then he's like, well, let's solve this by making everything uh, signed. And that part I disagree with. And I'll, I'll, let me go a little further before I, I, I respond to that more. Uh, and so, yeah, so, so if you were there last night, I, I mean, I went a little further, so I, I probably should do that here as well. Uh, you know, the, so, so, so Bjorn and I, I've met him a few times. We're actually Facebook friends for some reason. And, and one of the cringiest moments in my life was someone I went to high school with got into a an argument with him on my Facebook comment section. <laughs> so I was just like really cringing through that entire thing. Um, but, um, you know, he's, he's, he's a man, right? I mean, he makes mistakes. He's not always right. And the problem is, if you, if you take someone and you, you know, elevate them to, to God status, right, that means they can't be wrong. And suddenly you've got a cult of followers who who, you know, whenever this man says something wrong, they have to uh, pretend like it's right. And then they have to create a new reality in which that thing turned out to be right. 
And we have the same thing in, in the U.S. around Trump. You know, he's got all these, this cult around him. And he says things like, uh, oh, my father was born in Germany when his father was actually born in Queens. And then, you know, within, you know, uh, within a short while, suddenly uh, Queens is part of Germany, right? Because you have to adjust reality to, to match their statements. And so, uh, so, so you know, that's, it's quite dangerous for, the, for an ecosystem to, you know, establish a god, you know? I, I mean, you have to be able to, you know, people can be wrong. You have to account for that. Um, so, so the Google C++ style guideline, uh, you know, kind of picks up and, and runs with all this, right? So, so this is another really high profile document that people look at and believe and influences people. So here's what it says. I pretty much cut and paste this in. So first it says unsigned integers are good for representing bit fields and modulo arithmetic. Okay, so I agree with that entirely. Um, the second thing it says, because of a historical accident, the C++ standard uses unsigned integers to represent sizes. Uh, many members of the standards might believe this is a mistake, but it is effectively impossible to fix at this point. Okay, no, this was not a mistake, <laughs> okay? Um, C89 introduced the size T-type to represent sizes. Everyone in the C committee understands that size is an unsigned quantity. There's no wavering, there's no mistake about it, okay? Um, you know, basically, uh, you know, Bjorn has said use int, and some members of the standards body, uh, you, you know, some collection of extreme uh, worshipers or syncophants, uh, you know, have to accept that as, as gospel and, and go along with it. But it, it says many members, it doesn't even say a majority of members, right? But you, uh, you now have this insanity kind of emanating from C++. And, uh, you know, we got these interfaces in C and we had to change them. I mean, they're just defined incorrectly. So, um, so and, and, and they are right here that, you know, it's not going to change. Right? Everyone's acknowledging that uh, there's no way to change uh, the signedness of, of size T-type. It's always going to be unsigned. C and C++ are always going to have. So, so now saying, let's make everything an int, you know, is the wrong choice. That flies in the face of reality, right? Because we've acknowledged sizes are unsigned now. They'll be unsigned forever. Why are you going to make new sizes int? Right now you're exasperating the situation where you've got expressions that have both signed and unsigned numbers. You know, just make your sizes uh, size t as uh, you know God and the C standards committee intended. <laughs> Notice I, I said n, not you know considering them to be the same thing. Um, okay, so what's next? The fact that unsigned arithmetic doesn't model the behavior of a simple integer, but uh, is defined to model modulo arithmetic, wrapping around an overflow underflow, means that this significant class of bugs cannot be diagnosed by the compiler. Okay, so this again is just pure bullshit, right? So um, what do we say here? Unsigned arithmetic has modulo behavior. Well, what does signed integers have? Undefined behavior, <laughs> right? They can do anything. One of the things they could do is have modulo behavior, right? And typically, uh, they silently wrap around. They silently behave the same way as unsigned numbers. But they could also trap, uh, which uh, you know many many instructions do. Uh, div, you know, I give instruction on Intel processors traps on overflow on a, you know a very common processor. Uh, then they say that a significant class of bugs cannot be diagnosed, uh, and this is kind of uh, some additional um, idiocy, right? So, so, so kind of what this is hinting at is, uh, you know, hey, the advantage of signed integers is that they introduce UB, right? So now, uh, by using signed integers, you have more undefined behavior in your code, uh, and we can then, you know, because it's undefined behavior, we can trap on that and give you more information. So basically it's saying by making your filling, you know, uh, inserting a ton of bugs into your code, you're making your code better, okay? So when someone says that to you, you just slap them across the head. You know, they're experiencing some form of delusion. That's the stupidest thing that you can ever say. Um, and, you know, we just looked a minute ago, 
there's a sanitized flag for unsigned, it says unsigned integer overflow, that's a bit of a misnomer, it's unsigned integer wrapper, but there's a flag for that. So clearly tools can diagnose that. Uh, even if it's well-defined behavior, you can still diagnose it, right? Okay, it's non-conforming to the standard, but it's not a big deal. <laughs> you're not gonna ship that. You're, you're using it in diagnostic mode. And uh, some compilers, the IBM XL compiler, uh, you know, with the default flags, it's not conforming to standard. It actually assumes uh, unsigned integers don't wrap around, which of course is not what the standard says. Uh, and it doesn't matter that much. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, that's crap. Uh, in other cases, define behavior impedes optimizations. So I got a lot of these sort of sample codes, and it's all, um, you know, uh, basically adding extra code to signed integers, which is UB, and gets optimized out by the, the compiler because it's, it can ignore the possibility of UB. Um, but in no cases does, is that code necessary, and in no cases is, you know, the signed code faster than the unsigned code. So, so that turns out to be a, you know, an invalid argument as well. Um, that said, mixing signedness of intertypes responsible for a large class of problems. Okay, again, I agree with this. I just disagree with the solution. I think if you make more things signed, uh, you're gonna increase this problem because the, sign, the size types are not gonna change. Size of is always gonna return an, a size T type, an unsigned type. You can't change that. So, um, so I agree with this problem, but I, I think creating more signed types is, um, you know, when unsigned types should be used is just exasperating the problem. The best advice we can provide, try to use iterators and containers rather than pointers and sizes. Um, uh, try not to mix sideness. Uh, so, so this I agree with. Um, Oh, except that bit where it says try to avoid unsigned integers. I mean, unsigned integers should, should be used exclusively for bit fields and modular arithmetic. I kind of agree with that. Uh, but um, this try to avoid them is, is nonsense. Um, do not use an unsigned type merely to assert a variable is non-negative, right? This is what we took the poll on. And right there, there's, you know, every poll, the three polls I've done so far, you know, the overwhelming number of developers are not morons. Right? You all know that this is exactly why you use unsigned numbers. So this is, advice is contrary to common sense and, you know, everything holy. Uh, and this is, you know, this is really embarrassing. I mean, Google's a, you know, great company with a lot of smart people, and, and they're publishing, you know, garbage advice. You know, this is stuff people believe. You know, I mean, they're, they're, they're actively making things worse, much worse. Okay, so many um, uh, vulnerabilities are discovered using a combination of, um, you know, uh, code instrumentation and fuzzing. Uh, so for example, using a UBSAN, uh, signed integer overflow would diagnose uh, signed integer overflow. So, um, you know, uh, signed integer computations can be uh, diagnosed so that includes uh, F trap V, sign division uh, overflow. Uh, it doesn't include uh, lossy uh, implicit conversions. Uh, here we've got an uh, example of the use of the uh, unsigned integer overflow. And again, it's a bit of a misnomer, so it would be unsigned integer wraparound. But um, you know, here we've got an unsigned UIT 32 T type. Uh, we've got a wraparound here. And, uh, you know, the sanitizer does just a fine job of diagnosing this, right? So, so the idea that these problems can't be diagnosed is provably incorrect, demonstrably incorrect. Okay, so when I first started um, kind of realizing that there were these misconceptions about how to use signed and unsigned types, I, I asked people, you know, where is this coming from? And the first thing people pointed me at was this talk by Chandler Carruth, who, who might be at this conference. Um, and so I looked at this first. This is before I saw the uh, Bjarne talk, which was three years earlier than this. And so, um, so Chandler talked about performance of signed versus unsigned integers. 
And he used this code, which is um, from the, one of the spec benchmarks. I think it's the BZIP uh, spec, uh, bench spec marks. And I had, um, maybe 10 years ago, uh, I'd, I'd gotten a, a side gig to um, analyze this piece of code using a kind of a manual analysis method to see if it would, could detect a potential buffer overflow. So I was pretty familiar with this code. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, what Chandler pointed out is that on a 64-bit architecture, uh, uh, you know, we're using UNT32T uh, typed argument I1 and I2 uh, to form an address. So this becomes a 64-bit operation. But then uh, later, we're uh, incrementing I1 and I2. And in this context, um, there's no promotions or anything that are going to happen. So, so this operation has to be a 32-bit operation. So because we have a 64-bit operation and a 32-bit operation, there's some uh, redundancy in the code here. There's some operations that some additional instructions have to be generated, making this code uh, slightly slower. Uh, so here's, uh, oh, so here's the reality of this. So I took the code and uh, tested it and um, using a 64-bit architecture. So with the size T type at 03, uh, size T produced the fastest code uh, for, uh, on GCC, ICC, and Clang. So all three cases using size T, the correct type to use here, produces the fastest code. So how about that? You use the right type, it's fastest. Um, the relative performance of signed uh, int32t and unsigned uh, uh, uint32t depends on the compiler, but in all cases is worse uh, than size t. Uh, so, you know, using the properly typed unsigned integers produces the fastest code, right? So I just tested this, this claim and it's just, again, uh, incorrect. So, you know, I, 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 I uh, tweet it to Chandler to, with the results. And so he says, uh, just to be clear, this is a six-year-old talk. Compilers have actually changed this specific area significantly. Uh, it's also a very brittle area. In the retrospect, I should use a, a, a more durable example, which no one's shown me yet. <laughs> um, the idea was never to introduce UB, but that got lost. Uh, I don't think the point I hoping to make came across. I wish folks would stop citing this talk, <laughs> right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that that's a disavowal of this talk, right? He's walking away from this, uh, this argument, this claim that signed integers are faster. So if you went to that talk and you believed him, um, he's now telling you not to, right? He's disavowed this talk. Uh, okay, so let's talk about why uh, unsigned makes more sense. So signed integer overflow is undefined behavior in the C standard. Implementations can silently wrap, which is the most common behavior. Uh, it can trap or it can do some combination. And I usually use, you know, most familiar with uh, Intel architecture. Intel architecture, addition, subtraction, multiplication, silently wrap around while a division and remainder operations trap. So it's a fun, a fun, you know, fun trick is that int min remainder minus one. Well, mathematically, that should produce a zero on an Intel processor that will actually trap uh, because it's implemented as a division operation, and um, the result of the division operation is a um, overflow, which uh, results in a fault on x86 architecture. So, uh, so you've got some operations that silently wrap around, basically the same as unsigned, or they'll trap. So uh, I've never built a compiler, probably some of you have, uh, but um, you know, there's, there's, there's three basic um, implementation strategies for doing a compiler. Uh, the first is a hardware behavior model where you just generate the corresponding assembly code and let the hardware do whatever the hardware does. And, uh, you know, for the, 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 the more mature people in the room, I'll say that instead of the, the old people, the, the mature people, um, you know, that, that's been the universal policy for many years, so that's what, what many of us got used to. 
Um, there's a super debug model where uh, to provide an intensive debugging environment, you try to trap nearly every behavior. So things like address sanitizer and UB san sanitizer are kind of an example of that where you're trapping undefined behaviors. So this severely degrades performance, so uh, it, it's, it's not typically used for production code or for deploying uh, software. Um, and then finally, there's a total license model where uh, undefined behaviors treat it as a can't happen condition, and that permits very aggressive optimization. Now, now certainly, one of the things I've seen about um, compilers is that, you know, compiler writers really don't have any principles. <laughs> So, so you don't really see a purely hardware behavior th model or a purely total license model. Like you could take GCC and have two really similar loops that look almost identical and one will compile based on the hardware behavior model and the other one will compile based on the total license model. And it's just kind of a, it's kind of a relationship compiler vendors with, they have with their code bases where, you know, the compiler has adjusted so the code that's compiled with it will work and you know the code that's written for that compiler has kind of been tweaked so it works with the compiler, uh, and and you know that's okay. You know the compilers are trying to uh, you know help out their user base. Uh, it, it's not wonderful for portability, but but C is not, and C plus plus are really not intended to be portable languages. Uh, they're they're intended to be able to write you know, the optimally efficient code for a particular target architecture. That's the main goal. And it says so in the C charter. It says, you know, um, basically, uh, you know, opt optimal efficiency takes precedence over portability. Yeah, and, and everyone knows that if you've used it, right? It's pretty apparent. Java is an example of language which was designed to be portable. And the consequence of that is, <coughs> You know, there's been maybe two desktop applications written in Java over the past 30 years uh, because it's too fucking slow. Um, you know, so so they're both they're both fine languages. They they they're designed. They have different requirements. And you know, uh, if you give a, a, a bunch of really smart people the set of requirements that uh, the C people were given, you wind up with the C language. That's a natural outcome from, from their requirements. Um, okay, so, so here's an example of uh, integer overflow. Uh, so here's a bit of code that takes assigned integer i and it tests to see if it's greater than zero uh, and then it uh, doubles the value in i. And so, and then it increments a counter. And so basically this code is counting, you know, how many times can I double i uh, before it wraps around, right? That's sort of what this piece of code is doing. But, you know, uh, what, what you can see in this code is that there's an assu assumption of wraparound, right? And, and wraparound is undefined behavior. Sorry, you know, overflow or whatever you want to call it here. Overflow is undefined behavior. So the compiler knows that's undefined behavior and it can choose to ignore it. And uh, if this code is compiled with GCC, it does compile this using the total license model, which overflow cannot occur. So when it looks at this code, it says, you know, I'm doubling a positive number until it becomes negative. Uh, it's assuming, uh, you know, infinitely ranged integers that can double forever, that wraparound's not going to occur. And so it just says, well, they, they want an infinite loop, and it generates an infinite loop for this code. And uh, that is a valid interpretation of this undefined behavior. I mean, there's UB, so it can do whatever it wants, and that's what it thinks you mean here. Um, okay, so if we, we look at operators that wrap around, you'll see that most of them might. I, I should almost just give up on this headset. It's just not, I got a little bit too much hair, and it's a little bit too springy, and this, this thing just keeps popping off. So, um, so you see that you know most uh, operators can can result in wraparound. Two that can't are division and uh, remainder uh, with unsigned unsigned values. Uh, however, when you look at overflow, uh, both of these operators can overflow, right? And it's because on a two's confluent representation, 
you've got one more negative value than positive value, right? So like sine char has a range of minus 128 to 127, right? So if you negate the most negative value, it's not representable in that type. So if you take int min and divide it by minus one, that causes an overflow. The result of that operation is not representable. Also, if you use the unary negation operation on int min, it's unrepresentable. Um, and uh, I already mentioned the problem with uh, remainder. Int min remainder minus one uh, mathematically should produce a zero, but because it uses the division operation, it will also fault. So that's also undefined behavior. So what we see just here in these two slides is that you know, signed integers have more problems, right? There's just more things that can go wrong with them. I mean, this is two more things, but there's, there's a lot more things. We've already seen the conversion is an issue. Um, okay. So uh, I think I've probably discussed most of this. Um, so you can get overflow with division when you're dividing a a 30-bit or 64-bit integer by one, basically an int size integer, or a, you know a, a larger size integer. If you have a, if you have a like the minimum short uh, integer promotions, it's going to prevent the overflow because it'll be promoted to a larger size, that where the you know um, where that resulting value can be represented. But for int and int size and larger, you'll get a overflow. Uh, so on x86, that's a division error, um, and you wind up with a fault on interrupt vector zero. Uh, remainder, um, and you know, it's kind of funny, a lot of people think that's the modulo operator, and the, the C standard doesn't say uh, anywhere what it is, but you can tell it's defined uh, as part of division, so it's pretty clearly remainder. And the only place the word remainder appears is in the index for this operator, it says remainder and points you to the right page. So without that little little bit of hint, uh, there would be no mention at all of the name of this operator. Um, but um, so, uh, yeah, let me see here. Okay, so uh, if we do this int min remainder minus one, uh, that can be implemented as part of division operation. Uh, you can get overflow during uh, the remainder operation. And of course, if you, you know, the first thing you do with this uh, information is you go write a test and you, you type that in and it comes back with zero and you say, oh, my processor works fine for this. But of course, the problem is that it's going to be constant folded by the preprocessor uh, and the preprocessor is going to start with zero. And so you have to use variables and supply the information to make sure the actual instructions are generated and your, your test is valid. Um, okay, so what did we learn here? Uh, not to box Muhammad Ali, apparently, um, but that signed integers, you know, they're, they're the same or worse than unsigned integers for division and, and remainder operations, right? They are, they are more difficult. There's more edge cases that you have to be concerned about. I mean, every time you do a division with two untrusted inputs, you have to check to see whether... Uh, it's int min and minus one. I mean, you have to test for that edge case or your code could, could crash. Okay, so uh, there's a guy named uh, Dave, Dave LeBlanc, and uh, uh, he worked at Microsoft and he left Microsoft and he was back at Microsoft and now he's at Facebook. He went to a startup and it failed and then he, he went to Facebook. Um, so he's, he wrote the safe int C++ library that ships with uh, Microsoft Visual Studio and you know, is also available for other platforms and recently uh, implemented a version of the library for, for C. Uh, and so he sent me this code. This is his code. And basically what he said, uh, he's had, apparently he's had this actual argument directly with Bjorn, which, which I haven't had. I'm just looking at things that he's publicly said. But David's actually had this argument with him. Um, so this is an example of adding two sign numbers. Uh, so uh, according to David, there's one to three uh, uh, branches and extra subtraction necessary to do, uh, you know, signed integer addition uh, correctly, safely. The, the unsigned addition looks like this, right? 
So, so there's no waste instructions. There's only a comparison so you can test whether uh, you got a valid result. So um, I had an example of multiplication too, but it's just the same thing. If, if you want to do, you know, if you want, want to write safe, secure integer operations, it's always a lot more expensive using signed types than unsigned types, right? So this is, this is a big, big reason why unsigned types should be preferred. They're, they're you know, uh, you know, so it's kind of it's kind of the argument that you know if you don't mind if your code is incorrect, uh, signed integers can be faster. <laughs> you know, but if you want to write correct code, unsigned integers are always faster, right? And if you don't care if your code is correct or not, I, I don't really know how to talk to you, right? I mean, you could just write code that says return x, and uh, hey, it's incorrect. You're done. <laughs> you know, it's not, I don't, even, I don't understand the concept. <laughs> uh, so, you know, presumably you want to write correct code, especially if, you know, there's safety or security concerns. So it, it's always easier to, uh, and faster to check for unsigned uh, wraparound than, than signed overflow. I think that's, I think that's Sunny Liston there on the right. Does anyone know? I, I'm actually not that old. To, to remember this. I do remember Muhammad Ali boxing. Um, okay, so errors can occur using both signed and unsigned numbers. You know, there's not, um, you know, nothing is without problems. But signed integers should have more ways to fail. Um, and so you can write correct code with signed integers, and, you know, I, I'd like it if you did. Uh, but, but when you have signed integers, it, there's a greater cost. Uh, to making them work correctly. So it's going to be slower. It's the opposite of what Chandler Cruz said. Uh, signed integers are always going to be slower to use correctly. Um, okay, injecting UB into a program doesn't make it safer or more secure. It makes you look stupid. I mean, doesn't it, you know, oh, I'm going to inject a bunch of undefined behavior into my system, right? And that's somehow good. It's, 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 it's not a nonsense hard, uh, argument. And of course, Misra says, you know, no UB, so, so that's non, not, you know, Misra compliant. Uh, so unsigned integers are always less expensive if you're trying to uh, program correctly, uh, you know, safely and securely. So, so there's this common misconception among C++ developers and you know, I, I almost don't want to say misconception anymore. I mean, I think it's, uh, I think it's a uh, kind of a brainwash thing, right? They've, you know, they've, they've heard, um, they've heard a Bjarna say you sign in, and so they've, they've somehow, you know, got their brains to think that that's reality. So they're they're now, you know, under this illusion. That's the word. They're under an illusion that signed integers. Uh, you know, or should be the default type. They should be used everywhere. You don't need module arithmetic, right? That's what the Google style guideline said. Uh, so, so in fact, the opposite is true, is you should try to, to maximize the use of unsigned integers. I mean, so whenever you have a type that, you know, never has negative value, like a count of any kind, like a size, uh, it really should be represented as unsigned, and particularly a size, right? Because there's so many built-in things in the C and C++ standard that assume, you know, return unsigned types for size. You can't get away from that. Um, a yeah, that's good timing because I'm. Do you have any uh, <laughs> hand things to use the smallest possible unsigned integers, or you just use the biggest? Yeah. So you, you said ten things, but I'll. Yeah, I'll start with like one. So, so if you have if you have a variable, right, and say you have a value which can range from zero to 255, okay, so you could portably declare that to be unsigned char, right? Now I wouldn't do that, and the reason uh, so I would declare that to be unsigned int. So it's a waste of three bytes, but the problem with small types is they undergo integer promotions. Uh, so an unsigned uh, char would be promoted to signed int and well on most architectures <laughs> right and so the problem with integer promotions is that it introduces implementation defined behavior into your code right so depending on the architecture 
a, sh a small integer might get promoted to signed int or it might get promoted to unsigned int. So if I'm just dealing with a one-off variable and it's not a big concern about you know storage, then I would use nothing smaller than unsigned int or, or signed int. Now, if I have to have an array of uh, 10,000 elements, 0 to 255, well, yeah, I'm going to use unsigned char because because now you know there, there's, a, there's a significant use of storage. And then you know probably what you want to do is document some assumptions using static assertions about the behavior of your code if it depends on implementation d uh, defined behavior or you want to be very careful about how you write this code. You know, there's some tricky things like, you know, if you multiply the two largest unsigned short values, uh, it, it, it turns into a signed int and it overflows, unlike an x86 architecture where the short is 16 bits and the int is 32. And then you get all sorts of wackadoodle behavior because it's, it's UB. Uh, so there are some troublesome edge cases with, um, you know, sh small types, uh, short types, less than int or signed int. So, yeah, if it's just a one-off variable, I would never declare anything smaller than signed int or unsigned int. Uh, you, I guess? Uh, what's the rationale behind uh, having uh, unsigned data over unsigned operations instead of just defining what they actually do? Um, so, so UB exists for a variety of reasons. I'm going to guess at this a little bit because, again, I'm not quite that old. <laughs> These decisions were made. I started with the C committee in 2004, so I've been there about 20 years. But a lot of these decisions were made well before me. But but one reason for okay, one reason for declaring something UB is because it's hard to diagnose behavior. I don't think that that's it in this case. The second reason is because basically uh, different implementations do things differently, and um, the, the, the C standard doesn't want to dictate uh, a particular approach, so they make it UB to allow for differences in implementation. So, you know, uint uh, remainder minus one is UB because some implementations will produce a zero, right, if they have a remainder instruction separated from a division instruction, but some will fault. And so the standard says it's UB uh, s uh, because if they didn't, you basically wind up with Java, right? So Java says int min remainder minus one is zero, right? So on a Java compiler, on an Intel processor, you have to write some code to test for that edge case uh, and produce a zero on an Intel architecture, you know, introducing branches every time you have just a normal division structure. That's significantly going to slow down your code, and that's not what C and C++ is about. C, plus, C and C++ are about writing optimized code for a particular architecture and significantly shifting the burden to the programmer <laughs> to make sure that you get it right. Um, did that fully answer that question? Yeah. Okay. Because I, I forgot what the question was by the time I got to the end. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was wondering that as I was speaking, but, but that is definitely a category for why things are, are, are defined to be UB. Um, so I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask, which is why don't they change it now? <laughs> and the reason they will never change this is because compiler optimizers have spent the last 30 years coming up with so many clever optimizations around the fact that signed integer overflow is UB, that if they, if they defined it to be wraparound or defined as implementation defined behavior, uh, they'd lose all those op optimizations, right? Because they couldn't just assume the UB doesn't occur. Uh, so it's become now baked into the languages because of the investment in optimizations. Compiler vendors will never give it up. And, you know, and, and uh, I'm making compiler vendors sound awful. I mean, the problem is users will never give it up, right? Because if, if compiler vendors got rid of those optimizations and your code became 50% slower overnight, right, you would shit a brick <laughs> and start screaming at them on the phone and they would have to change it back. So they know this, right? Uh, and, and, and the reality of things is that it's still a performance-driven world. You know, the performance takes precedence over security and safety and every other thing. Um, and that hasn't changed.
Yeah, follow up? Don't don't worry, they'll 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 bill you for that. <laughs> okay, this is the last question because I got to go, but when yeah. you say that uh, unplanned open problems, I think there are some simple solutions um, or simple groups that uh, can be extracted from the topic. Like you have a list that you can compare to one. I think uh, uh, from there you um, change and simulate the IP operation or sometimes manually. Yeah, I, I think I think I, I think all the problems with signed and unsigned can be solved. Uh, I think there are more problems with signed, and I think the cost of solving the problems is, is high. Uh, so that you know advances unsigned, right? Okay, thank you everyone, and don't get in my way as I try to exit the building. <laughs>